two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, and for the last time in 2017, welcome to the SPF podcast with Mark Dawson and James Blatch. Episode 99, the last one of 2017, it all feels like um, a turning point in some in something. I've got 99 problems, James, and a podcast yeah. is all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a quite young reference for you. Quite young, it's not that young, goodness. No. Daisy, it's hardly well. like uh, for youngsters these days, he's about 50. Anything with rap in it is uh, is young. My my son, my eleven year old son, last night was doing some word for word, some quite complicated rap thing in the kitchen. You've got this to come. Your kids are just too young for this at the moment. But suddenly, YouTube is a corrupting influence on their lives. It did remind me of a young James doing Vanilla Ice in the uh, in the clubs in those <laughs> oh, days. God. Here we go, full partridge. Activate. It's t- time to go solo. <laughs> um, good. Now we have uh, chosen our um patreon member we're not going to reveal who it is yet until we've set everything up but uh, uh thank you very much indeed to everyone who volunteered for that we're going to do another one in just a few weeks so hold your horses uh, about that uh, you're not out of the uh, the frame yet and uh, you'll go onto the list forever having volunteered once for that so uh we're looking forward to that episode and we'll schedule it soon so that people know when it's coming um, you can become a patreon subscriber at patreon.com forward slash spf podcast uh we've got in the new year coming up on probably we think the 19th of january uh an interview with stuart base and that will be the time at which we announce the price and how you can buy Stuart's DIY cover design course we mentioned a couple of weeks ago. It's a really good course. Um, I'm in the process of editing where we stand at the moment, but we're, we think we're on target for that. So 19th of January, we're going to have Stuart on. It'll be a good podcast regardless of, uh, of the course, uh, talking about how you approach a brief, how you talk to a designer, what you need to do um, if you're going to do it yourself, which of course is, is in itself a... Um, a big thing to do because the cover is so essential to you but Stuart is the man to brief you on that. In this episode however we have a man who made a big splash in the uh, self-publishing world um, three four years ago with Let's Get keep, Digital. Keep going. More than that was yeah. it? How long ago was that? Probably I'd say five or six years actually so David Gogren yeah he, he's one of the, um, the early influences on me actually so in the same way that Joanna Penn is a friend now and and was a big influence on me and Johnny and Sean for SPP and Dave also uh, the same. Dave um, had had two books called Let's Get Digital and another one called Let's Get Visible. Digital was first, I think, and it it was really well written. Um, it, he's a really clever guy and helped understand how Amazon works as a marketplace. So whereas the other the other the retailers, Apple and Kobo tend to be more merchandiser based. So people making decisions in it was it would be the case at a, a normal bookstore. Amazon is algorithmically driven with a bit of merchandising as well. Um and David was one of the first people to lay all that out in um language that I thought was comprehensible. something something I could understand. And by taking some of his um his lessons, I suppose, his his learning, was able to to kind of kickstart my own books, and and then Dave went quiet for a while, um, and uh, has recently come back again and started doing some speaking. Um, he's he's working on new books. He's he's blogging. Um, also, worth saying before we, I don't know what, how much this you got into in the interview, James, but the something that he is really excellent on is is standing up, um, and. This sounds like a bit of a superhero thing, but fighting injustice where he sees it. So he's not afraid to go toe to toe with Amazon if he sees things like Kindle um, unlimited scamming going on and and people using uh, you know, nefarious authors. And I use that word very lightly, um, using bots to shoot their books up the charts and then make money. Um, David will call that out all the time um, and is is kind of almost like a shop steward. Um, to use a, I'm not sure how universal that that term is, but he's kind of like if there was a union for authors. He would teamster. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, American that's expression. Kind of, it's kind of it. But if if he was a if there was a, a trade union, he would be um, towards the top of the trade union. He'd be the one going on on television and decrying various injustices. Yeah. So yeah, he, he's a he's a great guy. Um, 
and uh, has a, has a, I don't know if he still has his beard, but he's got it even. Better. Yes, he does. It's not not too dissimilar to yours, although it's sli- I think he's he purchased the beard trimming kit, <laughs> yeah. beard maintenance kit before you did because yeah. it's quite sort of tailored. Yeah, I need to work on my beard anyway. Yes, yeah, so sculpted. He's yeah, all, all beard um, envy aside, he is um, he, he's a really great guy, and I'm very pleased to get him on the podcast. He is, and uh, yeah, we sat down together uh, in the States um, in October, I think. Um, so if you're watching on YouTube, it's a full video presentation uh, of the interview, and you can see it, not only his well-sculpted beard, his well-sculpted moustache as well, which is a signature. Uh, yeah, absolutely right, I think, uh, uh, what you say about David. I think he's uh, he's outspoken, which is one way of putting it, which you, this industry needs, um, and he's incredibly bright, really interesting guy to talk to. And what he's thinking about now, the next thing, is what this interview is about, so... Let's hear from Dave. David Gochran. Yes. Welcome to the <laughs> SPF podcast. It's been um, uh, it's been a, an ambition of ours to have you on for some time, and it was uh, serendipitous that we bumped into each other here in a in the US. It's been an ambition of mine to get inside your hotel room for, for quite some time, yeah. so thank you. I was I mean, I'm slightly alarmed that they put the beds right next to. So I was hoping when I we had the suite knowing it's going to be used for filming that the, the suite bit would be as you walk in and then the bedroom would be hidden away and instead people have to walk through my bedroom and they look unnerved see that. your drawers all over the floor see my smalls <laughs> yeah your, your tight whiteies <laughs> anyway moving swiftly on <laughs> we can return to that later yeah yeah let's let's get back into detail on that um yeah david so why don't you for the uninitiated yeah uh, introduce yourself uh, my name is david gochran i'm uh, an irish self-publisher um i'm more known for for writing non-fiction for writers, writers how tos. I wrote Let's Get Digital and Let's Get Visible. But my main, my main genre is historical fiction. And uh, this year is actually the first year where my fiction sales have reached my non-fiction sales. So I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Okay, that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, and your Let's Go Digital. So there's, I know there's a book, but also you blog quite a lot, and you're yeah. quite high, you're quite visible in the self-publishing uh, yeah. world. I, I, yeah, I, I do start the odd fight on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, I remember someone asked me, like, what's the best way to use Twitter? And, and I always say, like a cudgel, just hit them repeatedly until they break. Hammer it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and when did this start for you in terms of you sort of having a, an expert opinion or authority? I don't, wanna, I don't know how you, 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 you brand yourself, but being somebody who had a voice on, on how to do things. It's really funny. Like I was really stretching the definition of expert when I when I first started doing this because like when I when I wrote when I released Let's Get Digital, I think I'd sold maybe a hundred books. I'd been self publishing for about six weeks. I'd been writing for about two years. So yeah, I wasn't exactly like an expert. Um, but back in two thousand eleven, there wasn't all these resources that we have now. Um, like people are always saying, oh, it's so much harder now and all this kind of stuff. But the tools we have now are amazing. You know, like there was, I don't think there was any self, like I didn't know of any self-publishing guidebooks at the time. So that's why I wrote one. Um, like there was one or two out there, but they seem to be more focused on like either print self-publishing, like the old school kind of way, or it was written from the perspective of someone who might have been a trad author with like 10 reverted backlist titles and how they launched themselves. There wasn't really something for a beginner. And, um, Sometimes they say the best teacher is the one who's one step ahead of the class. And with that in mind, I, I totally dived in. And actually, it was, it was all totally accidental. Like, um, basically, it all started with, with a, with a bun fight online. Someone saying that self-publishing was only for people with a huge backlist and uh, newer authors were better off, still querying agents and all that kind of stuff. And they were like, all these people like Joe Conrad, they all have, they've come to it with an audience built in and all this kind of stuff. So I was like, okay, look, I'm going to self-publish because I can't get an agent. I was trying for 18 months, couldn't get one. Um, and I'm going to blog about it, so you can see whether this is all, you know, BS or not. Um, so I did, and I started every week. It was just like, okay, this week I'm going to try and find an editor, and and then I would go around read a few blog posts, talk to some people, and then I, I would just post about the experience. And then the following week, I was looking for a cover designer, and then so week by week, and it was like it was, this was the year, the summer that self publishing broke into the mainstream. I think it was, it might have been the summer when J.K. Rowling self-published the Harry Potter eBooks, which people in traditional publishing still won't accept the fact that yeah. she has self-published. And she but still she has, does that. She has she those still, rights for she life. She still does she? that. She still does that. Um, now, she does it in a slightly different way than I do, but yeah. it's still self-publishing. Um, but anyway, that was the summer when it broke into the mainstream. So there was a lot of people starting to self-publish, and there wasn't a lot of resources out there. So I was just in the right place at the right time. The blog really took off. Soon I was getting like, I don't know, I was getting like 100,000 views a month out of nowhere. And I was a nobody who hadn't sold anything and didn't know anything. But all the people in my comments at the same time were looking for an editor. 
looking for a cover designer, trying to figure out marketing. Um, so we're all helping each other. And then at the end of the process, when I finally published, like I think it was just a, a short story that I published first, somebody just said, can you put all these blog posts in a PDF so I can download it? Um, and I was like, sure. So I started doing that. And, and then I was like, well, I appear to be writing a book here. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe I should you know, clean up this chapter and write a bit of introductory text here. And before I knew it, I'd written Let's Get Digital and published it. And then it was just, it was in the right place at the right time. I was lucky with, um, I think Joe Conrad gave me a blurb quote um, just before the launch. And that was, that was huge. Um, there was the, the Pixel of Ink website, gave it a lot of promotion the month it came out. And, and that was huge for me as well. And it just took off from there. Yeah, and you, you, so you you helped people, guided them through those early days yeah. of stuff. I mean, you weren't you talked about finding a cover designer. You were giving advice on how to find a cover designer. Yeah. it wasn't a directory listing in there. No, early days, no, right? it was like it, it wasn't just like how to find one, but also how to brief them. Yeah, like because uh, I, I I was kind of cheating a little bit in that um, my sister was a professional cover designer. She worked well. She started off working for EMI doing doing uh, album covers. And then she moved to Harper Collins and she was a, a cover designer there for years. And then she went freelance. So um, she was able to teach me how to brief a cover designer. Like she would show me the, the, the sheet they would use in HarperCollins where you give them your comp authors and you give them examples of covers you like and you don't like. So I totally stole all that and then monetized it. Well, well that's how the world works. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's fine with that, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you had a big hit with Let's Go Digital, and that's yeah. kind of how you're. That's how I know you. Yeah. Um, in that way, and I'm interested to talk to you about your your writing in a minute, your sort of yeah. nonfiction writing. Um, but you you continue to update and upgrade, and your blog posts are relevant mm. and stuff. And how much has changed then from 2011 to today, in your view? Well, I, do you know what? Right. Uh, again, this is something where I've totally changed my mind. I used to get annoyed with people saying, "Oh, everything's changing all the time." And I'm like, "No, it's not. The fundamentals are always the same. You got to package your." product professionally, you got to go to where your readers are and all that kind of stuff. But you know what, um, the last six months things have changed so much, like like KU has changed everything, it's changed everything. And uh, I'm going to be talking about this over the weekend here at Nink, but um, I think the population of successful authors is bifurcating into people who are successful on Amazon and people who are successful wide. And if you look at the authors who are successful wide, who are selling a lot on Kobo, Apple, whatever. The rankings on Amazon aren't so good, considering the size of their readership. And that got me thinking, like, what's going on here? And then, obviously, the people who are in KU are only selling on Amazon, and they're, and they're killing it there. And I think, you know, um, basically, if you're not in KU, every hour there's thousands of KU-powered salmon over, like, leapfrogging your book and pushing you down. And aside from that, the other way that it's changed everything is that, okay, if I'm in KU and I run a countdown deal, 99 cent, right, I'm getting 70% royalties on that. And if you're wide, you're only getting 35%. That means I can spend twice as much on my marketing. So what's happened, it, it's an arms race now in KU. People are coming up with mad campaigns, multi-pronged efforts where you've got like BookBub, CPM ads, you've got Facebook campaign going on, you've got newsletter swaps, email marketing, and then the, the usual way of you know, advertising on ENT and Robin Reads and stuff. And it's just become so much more complicated. There's a lot more spending going on if you want to hit the, the top level on Amazon. Um, yeah, so like just in the last six months, it's getting insane. If you stand still, if you're in KU and you stand still for a second, you're you're just you're you're run over straight yeah. away. So you've got to keep on top of that. You've got to keep yourself briefed. You've got to know what's working. Yeah. Is it is it still a golden opportunity for self published writers, or is it becoming too tough? Oh no, no, absolutely. Like like um, there, there's no doubt that the waters are choppier now, but the rewards are greater. You know, like when I started in 2011. I remember on K-Boards, we used to have a monthly thread where people would post their sales. And if someone hit, they had something called a thousand book a month club. And if someone hit a thousand books a month, that meant they made it, which sounds kind of quaint now, right? Because you can get a book club ad and sell 2,000 in 24 hours just by you know, filling out a form. Um, so yeah, it has changed a lot, but the market, the market is so much bigger. And like, you know, if you don't want to play that KU game, there, there is another way to reach readers. Like, and if you look at the guys who are wide, they're marketing in a totally different way. The successful guys are marketing in a totally different way. And I, I'm seeing like two different marketing models emerging. So in the KU is the big like monthly campaigns, throw everything at it, a uh, huge blast for like four, five, six days, and then try and coast off the rank for the rest of the month. Um, and people will like when they're, like I'm, I'm helping someone launch a fifth book in a series at the moment this week. And we're doing a, um, a countdown deal on, a 99 cent countdown deal on the first book. 
a free run on the second book, a 99 cent countdown deal on the third book, a 199 countdown deal on the fourth book, and launching the fifth book at 299 instead of 499. And we'll probably keep those prices down for a week or two after launch. Right. Because KU is all about visibility. Like you're willing, you're you're giving up short term money for long term rank, and that rank will turn into page reads. Yeah. But if you're wide, you don't have the page reads, and the way you have to market is totally different. I think. And if you look at the success with guys. They're not doing this once a month huge blast. They're doing constant drip marketing in the background. They'll focus more on aggressive um, email list building strategy. They'll do a lot of lead gen ads on Facebook. They'll have small lower level campaigns running um, on BookBub CPM ads, targeting Kobo readers in Australia, targeting Apple readers in, in England, you know, and just little small budget campaigns, but like little streams constantly all the time. Um, and what's interesting is some people will use the wrong marketing approach with the the right marketing approach with the wrong distribution method. Mm-hmm. So you see some people trying a drip approach when they're in KU and it doesn't work because you need to go big. Uh, and you see some people trying to do the, like when I was wide, I was trying to do the monthly big blast approach and it wasn't working for me. So you have to, if you're, for me the question is not about should I be wide or should I be in KU? It's which marketing approach do I want to take? Which is going to suit my books? Or if I'm going to be wide, if I, you know, if I hate exclusivity and refuse to put all my eggs in one basket, then I have to realize I have to retool my marketing approach. Like, I'm, I'm actually going to be doing this now. I'm, I'm rolling everything out of KU. I'm going wide. And so I have to change my marketing approach. I have to look more at lower level, constant drip, drip, drip kind of campaigns. Are you going to blog this process? So Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'm, I know I'm, it's a bit of a faff I'm, writing everything down again. But. I know, yeah. No, I'm actually, that, that's a, a big thing I decided at Christmas that I'm, I'm trying to make every, every piece of work work for me in two or three different ways. So um, I, I'm giving a talk here on Nink about that kind of approach. It's also gonna be a book, I'm gonna blog about it. Um, yeah, and just just try and use my time a bit more smartly. So I can I can see that, you know, some people are loving this they're, and they're, they're tuning in, they're thinking, okay, this is like next level stuff. I've got to really understand. Mm-hmm. It's not just good enough to do marketing techniques, it's gotta be the right products. Yeah. Other people are listening to this and thinking, oh my, I don't know, you know, I don't know where to start. And it can be, a, but you must have a mind for this. It can be daunting for people, particularly at the beginning of their careers. Sure, but like you, you, you realize like, okay, like, None of us spring from the womb fully formed as like, you know, excellent writers or, or marketing geniuses. Just take it step by step. Like your aim when you publish your first book is not to hit number one in the Kindle store. You know, that would be nice, but it, that's not your aim. Your aim is to start building an audience. So you, actually like the template, um, even when you talk about this, this kind of mad KU strategy, it's still the same basic template where like what we, what we used to do when, when it was a bit simpler to get, to get into the charts was, you would just run a sale for a few days and then you would advertise to tell people about it. And you would use that to increase your sales and increase your mailing list and increase your reviews. And it's that same model. We're just layering stuff on top of it. So don't get intimidated if, if you're thinking like, oh, this is, this is too difficult. Um, I'm talking about stuff that it takes to, to launch a book to 120 in the Kindle store and keep it there for five or six weeks. And that's, that's mad money, you know? Um, and you don't need to be aiming for that right at the start. At the start, you just need to be, well, your, your first focus should be making sure that you're, you're going to market with a, with a professional package because there's no, there's no bush league, as they say in the States. You're, you're, you're straight away, you're, you're, in an, you're, 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 com- you're competing against Stephen King and, and, and everyone else. You know? There's no separate market for beginners. So you've got to realize that readers demand a professional product. It's got to be well edited. It's got to be well formatted. You've got to have a good cover on it to make sure that the right readers find it. And just focus on that stuff first. And like, I think people are in a big hurry these days. They're like, oh my God, I've been self-publishing for six months and I'm still not making six figures a year. You're like, dude, like relax. <laughs> you know, it's okay to take a couple of years to get there, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, and then Mark says exactly the same thing, that uh, your book should be indistinguishable. That's your first priority. Yeah. Indistinguishable from the big five. Well, I guess finishing the book and writing a good story, that's still, that's still for me the hardest part, by the way. Yeah. So like, if you can write a good book, yeah. you're more than capable of, of, of figuring everything else out. The publishing part, that's actually the easiest, right? Yeah. Once you do it once, you can do it in your sleep. Yeah. Marketing. I mean, there are people the other way around by the way, who, who naturally just have been writing their whole lives and they love writing books and they struggle with the marketing. Yeah, yeah. but they, did, they, didn't, they didn't start off being, being able no. to write in their sleep, right? It took them 10 books to learn that. So don't worry about it. You'll, you'll learn as you go. Yeah, good. Um, and, you know, so you, it was still optimistic about the environment and it still oh, feels totally. like this is a, a golden age. And we had um, Sean and Johnny in here from the SPP podcast yesterday and they were very much this is the infancy of self-publishing. There's no maturity to this industry. We don't know what it's going to look like. And they're doing some really interesting stuff. Nobody knows what this is going to look like. And the stuff you were talking about, that's how we used to do it. 
you talk about nine months ago. I mean, yeah. things are happening so quickly now. Yeah, but like... But it's good. It's, it's good. What the point I'm making is that this is... And if you can stay a little bit, give yourself a little bit of an edge in one area. Yeah, well, I, I think people stress too much about changes and stuff. Like, like, well, like if you zoom in, yeah, it seems very turbulent. But like, if you zoom back a bit, like I, any talk I'm giving, I usually open with, with the same slide. Uh, it, saves, it saves on a bit of work as well. Uh, but it's, <laughs> it's, and it's just a slide saying $125 billion on it. And that's the amount of money that consumers spend on books every year globally. Because we often focus on changes. We focus on, oh, Amazon's doing this, or, you know, it's difficult to do that. It's hard to get visibility. Um, but we're very zoomed in because we're looking at it day, day by day. But if you zoom back, people spend a huge amount of money on books every year. Now, it might be going into different pockets, depending on, you know, which way the wind is blowing. But that money is still out there. Like, sometimes we talk like people have stopped reading. They haven't. Like, people are reading more than ever. Like, the publishing industry likes to spread bad news stories all the time. I think it helps them not pay authors very much. Yeah. You know? Um, and usually you get, like, a very expensively tailored agent at a conference telling you that advances are going down. It's terrible. And you go, you seem to be doing yeah. okay. <laughs> like, I call it the sartorial index. You know, when you go to a conference and you see who's, who's the best dressed, and you see the authors, like, with holes in their trousers, and then you see the editor in a kind of a nice, you know, suit, and then you see the agent, like, you're coming in on a helicopter, you know, with, with, with two models getting off with them, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you, you, when you look at the traditional way the traditional industry works, and we've had several conversations with people who are transitioning or in both uh, here at Nink, you cannot get away from the fundamental that there's a company there and that the less they pay the author, the more the company makes. And yeah. that, that is their drive and that is that relationship. Like the biggest, the biggest lie that, uh, that traditionally published authors tell themselves, I think, is, and it's fed to them by agents and editors, is that they always have, your interests are always perfectly aligned with either your agent or your, your, your publisher. And it's not true. Like you, you actually have like when you're when you're having a negotiation, that's that's quite adversarial. Like they want to pay you as little as possible to, to get your rights and you want to get as much as possible. I think, you know, yes, you are trying to make money together, but you know, they want more of that money. So you you've got to remember that. And you've got to you've got to remember that the only person that has your best interest at heart is you. And the only person that will ever care as much about no one will ever care about your book as much as you do. And your editor might care about it now, but next week he's gonna care about someone else's book. Because like HarperCollins, they publish what? A thousand two hundred books a year or something, mm. you know they 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 have a duty to move on to the next author, um. So yeah, if they're publishing several books a day, like how how much attention are you really going to get? So that, that 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 for me is the biggest reason to self-publish. That that you will always you will always care about your book, whereas an editor might not. They might move on. They might get fired. They might move on to a different company. Uh, you might fall out with them, or you know uh, you might leave your publisher for whatever reason. Um. But yeah, if you're if you're if you're the captain of the ship, like you're always in control. And like, your sales might drop on a particular book, but you can put a new cover on it. You can run a new marketing campaign. And, and that's just not poss possible if you sold the rights. Yeah. So the publisher, writer, interests are never more aligned than when you self-publish. Yeah, exactly. Because you're, you're, you are all those people. Yeah, exactly. Um, nobody's going to work harder for you. Um, good. Well, it's, in, you know, it's, it's, it's brilliant to see. And this industry is dotted around with people like you and Mark and think you've very similar outlook who make it part of what they want to do and also part of their business to help other people yeah. um, and navigate this. And without that, in these early days of, of self-publishing, it would be virtually impossible. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's for me, like, um, sometimes, I remember when I wrote Let's Get Visible, a couple of people were sending me messages saying, like, why are you giving away all the secrets, you know? And I was like, but, like, you know, that's, that's how we all got started. It's, it's been a very open source approach. Like, yeah. um, we've all, we've all kind of hacked the system together and cracked the code and figured it out. And it would, be, it would be wrong to pull up the ladder now just because, you know, you think too many people are, are getting on the boat or whatever. No, it doesn't work like that. It's not even close, though, because you, I mean, everyone here, not actually not everyone at Nink, but most people you meet at Nink know a lot of this stuff and are really interested in, and want to talk to you about it. And mm. Everyone who listens to this podcast is that they're already way ahead of the average self-publisher who we've never met, Yeah, who sits in their home in Idaho or London or somewhere and doesn't, has, doesn't listen to a podcast and doesn't know what to do. And that's, if you look at how many books are self-published every day, mm. and you could probably list all the people we know and come across and listen to the podcast. It's a small part of it. Yeah, but I, like I, 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 like I don't care so much about these raw numbers. Like people focus on them. Like oh, there are so many books or whatever. Like people go freak out. There's like six million books in the Kindle store. Oh my god, what are we going to do? There's twelve to fifteen million print books, right, on Amazon. There's thirty-four million books in print. If you take out in, in take account of the wider world outside of Amazon, uh, Google calculated that if you if you count all the titles that are still available for purchase in places like secondhand stores, 
there's 140 million distinct titles in the world. So the Kindle, Kindle store is actually a fairly small pool in comparison yeah. to the rest of it. So like, and anyway, let's be honest, half the books are, are, are rubbish. They're invisible. They don't need, like something like, I, I think I worked out that a quarter of the books in the Kindle store don't even have a rank. So they never sold a book. So they're not competition. You don't need to worry about it. Um, I think George Carlin said, uh, if you think how stupid the average person is, think that half of them are stupider than that. You know, so like, <laughs> so what I mean is like, okay, you might think like, oh my God, there's so many books in, in, in space opera right now. But really, how much of that is actual competition? It's a, it's a small yeah. number of titles. And if you, if you do the basics, like write a good book, package it professionally in the way that readers in that genre expect, you're, you're, you're ahead of 90% of people yeah. already. So don't, don't worry about these big numbers. Worry about yourself. Yeah. Brilliant. Like, like people freak out about the market. They say like, oh, sales are up, sales are down, or, or it's the summer slump. I hate this meme about the summer slump. It doesn't matter. All that matters is what you were doing with your own promotions, how fast you're, you're releasing, um, and what you're doing to reach readers. Like these macro things, are, are, they're, they're fun to talk about at a conference, but they don't really affect you on a micro level. Yeah. It matters what you do. And by the way, some of the worst books on the Kindle store are traditionally published books have been badly formatted. I'm reading one yeah. at the moment. It's a really good, well-regarded non-fiction. And it probably wasn't cheap either. wasn't cheap. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's... Do you want to name and shame? Um, <laughs> no, okay, you don't have to. A little bit hesitant about doing that. It's a really good book. Um, but I'll tell you afterwards and you can, you can decide whether you want <laughs> I'll to. I'll tweet it. But, but just badly formatted. And you get to the end of paragraphs and there's hyphens because they're formatting. And no one's gone, it looks like no one's gone through it afterwards. Well, you know what, right? Um... I know for a fact that it's not, I, I actually know how the quality control process works at a lot of large publishers. They, they take the, what, not the PDF, what do they, what do they use? Adobe InDesign, right? And they, okay. they, they take a, they use an automated tool to, to, to convert that to EPUBs and, Mo, and then they convert it to Mobi. Whereas we start with the Mobi, when, yeah, and like yeah. I actually, I actually do it all in HTML myself to make sure it looks perfect. But um, yeah, like the first thing most self-publishers do after they publish a book is buy, buy, buy a copy, right? They buy a copy straight away, so that you get the also bots starting to roll. You get your, uh, you get your rank quicker. Um, like I would buy a copy straight away, and I don't hit my mailing list or start my launch plan usually until that rank has arrived, because I feel like I'm I'm going to be invisible in the recommendation engine. But anyway, for a variety of reasons, most self-publishers will buy a copy of their book first, and uh, just to check it's not broken. Yeah. You know, and traditional publishers don't do that. They don't even do that for their biggest authors. Like it's amazing when, if you look how badly they handle their biggest names. And then you think like about the people who are on a $5,000 advance. Yeah. It's like, I remember, like Dan Brown's just released a new book this week. But I remember when The Lost Symbol came out, I think it was two or three years ago. And Random House did something very unusual for a big publisher. They made the Da Vinci Code free for like three weeks or something because they, they didn't really know what they were doing. They should have done it for like five days. But they made it free for like three weeks and it probably got like a quarter of a million downloads at least, right? Um, I know it was on BookBub and it was, in, it was all over the place. And obviously that's still a, bit, you know, a big draw, that book, and would have been selling a lot. So it was, it was quite brave of them to, to take that step. And then, so I, I bought it out of curiosity. I was like, okay, let's see, let's see if they're doing this right, because I'm fascinated that they, they made Da Vinci Code free. And I paged, I, I, I didn't read it, obviously, because it's Dan Brown and it's going to be terrible. But I paged It's the, a good book. Oh, come on. Dan Brown is probably... Yeah, anyway, we it's won't a, get it. It's a, it's a, it's <laughs> he's, he's the guy I love to hate in terms of his writing. I think he's clever. My editor says the same. He's it's cleverer like the, than you think. The, and it, the, the tall it, man walked into the long room and spoke to the you know sad woman. It's just... Jenny Parrott, who's been on this podcast, says there's a trick to make your reader feel they're ahead of you. Oh, look, look this thing. Right, I read one of his books, Angels and Demons. I was backpacking somewhere and it was the only book available. And... Uh, I read it. I read it in four hate-filled hours. I yeah. couldn't stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, no, because like but the, you couldn't stop. Exactly. So like, what I find these bestsellers and all of them, Fifty Shades, whatever, whatever the one you love to hate is, they all, they all, they're all excellent at pacing. Yeah. And that, that's the real trick, I think, to a bestseller. It's, a, it's the pacing and the emotional arc. But uh, and the writing doesn't have to be good, obviously, <laughs> with some of these books. But anyway, so Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code Free, page the end of the book to see what the end matter is like, mm -hmm. and. I was like, oh, they're doing this right. There's a, there's a chapter here from The Lost Symbol, which wasn't out yet. It was going to be out the, the following week. And I was like, interesting. And then I paged the end to see if they linked to the pre-order on Amazon, and they didn't. No. There, was no, there was no mailing list sign-up. There was no link. And it was, the pre-order was up on Amazon. They could have linked to it. Uh, the, only, the only web link in the back of the book was to Anchor Books, which was the imprint of Random House publishing mm -hmm. The Lost Symbol. So I clicked on that and go to the homepage of Anchor Books, and you know the punchline here, right? No mention of Dan Brown yeah. or the lost like symbol. A, like a corporate homepage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, come on, guys. You were so close yeah, to yeah. getting this right. And so what I always think is, if that's the treatment Dan Brown, probably their biggest author, the biggest release of the year, if that's the treatment he's getting, what kind of treatment are you going to get on a basic advance? Yeah. But that's why the traditional industry 
I, you probably had the same approach as Mark. So Mark has asked every month by somebody in the social industry, can you run our campaigns for us? Yeah. Because they understand something's going on that they don't really know the detail about. They're, they're just starting to realise, like they've always been very dismissive of self-publishing and of e-books and like, you know, all these articles all the time in the New York Times or whatever saying e-books have plateaued, yeah. um, which is can, rubbish. Yeah, yeah. They're mistaking their own shrinking market share for a shrinking market. And what I, I think the ebook market is 50 or 60% bigger than they think it is. And we've grabbed all of that. We, like, cause we've, we've taken something like 40% of the, of the US market now in, in terms of unit sales. And they have no idea. They're just starting to, to get a little bit curious about how big self-publishing is. They're like, maybe something's going on here, you know? Like, I, but I don't know how they wouldn't have known this already. Like if you look at, if you look at military science fiction or something, right? And you look at the top 50, it's all self-published books. There's no traditional author. And, and that genre, that category used to be dominated by, by Bain, right? And those guys are all ranked down at 300,000 in a Kindle store. So no wonder they think ebooks are a fad that, that have peaked. They have no idea how much the market has grown because we're grabbing it all. We're drinking their milkshake. Yeah. Yeah. And how brilliant is that? And it's a tasty, tasty, yes. <laughs> tasty milkshake. Sweet, sweet milkshake. Um, Let's talk about you a little bit, David. So right. uh, people can probably tell from you, or hopefully they tell from your accent that you're Irish and yeah. you, you live in Dublin now, but you do. I do, yeah, yeah. Well, my, my accent is softened a bit because I was away for a while. Um, not in prison, I was in other countries. <laughs> away for a while. <laughs> other, <laughs> other countries. Uh, Import-export scheme went a bit wrong. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I moved back to Dublin last September, so I'm home about a year now. I was, I was living in Prague before that, and uh, London actually before that, and Sweden before that, and then South America and all over the place. Yeah, well, Dublin's a great city, and is that your home? You, it is, yeah. You, yeah. So is, that's where born, you come born from. Bread born and bread and butter, does, as Ronnie Drew used to say. Yeah, and yeah. Dublin, I mean, lots of countries, like France is like this, I think Paris is very cosmopolitan, and once you move out of it, it becomes very rural, but yeah. that's so pronounced in Ireland, isn't it? Literally, and as you walk to the fringes of Dublin, it yeah. suddenly becomes farms and yeah, yeah. very rural. So I always think Dublin, it's Dublin and the rest of Ireland. Well, it's actually like, like I live in, in Smithfield in Dublin and there's, um, th there's a few horses nearby, like, like cause it, it used to be... It's just in a field living. Yeah, no, yeah. like it'd be in a, like it'd be in a shed or something. There's like, it used to be traditional for some certain sectors of the working class to, to own horses in the city. And actually that square used to be an old, uh, an old horse market uh, when, when the British built it a few hundred years ago. So there's still a tradition of owning horses in that area and it's right in the city centre. Like it's, it's like five minutes from Temple Bar. It's really funny. That's amazing. So yeah. occasionally you see a lost tourist kind of walking through the area and some guy coming on bareback on a horse yeah. <laughs> down the square and they're just like... Yeah. You don't get that in America, well, it's, unless it's a policeman and a, a yeah. truncheon. Do you know what? I'm just going to push that open a little bit, John, because it's getting it's very warm. It's quite, yeah. quite weird. It's sweltering in here, and uh, we've only got a few more minutes yeah. to go, David. And I can see that we're both melting. Melting. The um, the breeze will get that going in here. Um, so your historical fiction. Just yeah. talk to us a little about your your fiction books. You've got two series. Of, uh, no, like the first the first two, because because I'm uh, I'm an idiot. The first two I wrote were standalones, and okay. uh, I finally got with the program and and started decided to try and uh, write a series because when I read historical fiction I, I like reading just a, a big meaty standalone you know and mm -hmm. um, like I like reading a series when it's like science fiction or epic fantasy or something but with historical fiction for some reason as a reader I always preferred reading big meaty standalone so that's what I was drawn to first when I started writing them I didn't want to write a series and um, but then you know it's like fighting with one hand behind your back it's so much easier to market when you have a series there's so many more options you get much more spillover between titles. Like when I promote one of my standalones, even if, even if it has a good run in BookBub or put together a good campaign, it'll do all right for that week or whatever, but then it doesn't, there's no real halo to it because it's not spilling over to another title. You can't push two things together. They're not related. It's, it's so hard to get readers to jump from one standalone to another if you can't connect them in some way in your marketing. Um, but with a series, you have that automatic connection. It's the same character, or it's the same town, or, or, or whatever. Um, so I said, okay, I've got I've to try and figure out how to do this, and how to do it in a way, you know, because if I'm going to write a five-book series, I'm not a fast writer, especially with historical fiction, all the research. Um, I'm like, I'm going to be doing this for a few years, so I've got to do something that's not going to drive me crazy as well. So can I do this? And, and the, the, actually, I enjoyed it way more than I thought. Uh, the intellectual challenge of trying to solve that puzzle where you, instead of you know, thinking about one arc, it's like a series of arcs and an overall one and all that, all that good stuff. Um, so I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, well, tell us about the books. Okay, so like the, the, the first two books I wrote were, they were again, like I'm, I'm definitely not like one of the people who's proof that the agent system is broken. Like it wasn't the most commercial book. It was set in, in Argentina in the early 1800s. It's about the story of um, 
Argentina's fight for independence against the Spanish Empire, um, which is fun and interesting, but it wasn't exactly the, the most commercial setting. You know, it's not the biggest niche. It's not like the Tudors or anything, you know. Um, so I wrote that one, and then I tried to meet the market market halfway with the second one. I had like an American character down in Latin America during the when the banana companies come in and mm -hmm. the Americans start toppling governments and all that kind of stuff. And that, that sold a bit better because that was slightly more commercial. People could relate to it a bit more with, a, with an American protagonist. But this time I was like, okay. And I, I, was, I remember I, I went to the pub for an afternoon where, where all great all, ideas all are born. All the best ideas, yeah. And, Particularly uh, Dublin pubs, I think, yeah. if that's where it was. Oh, it was Prague, actually. I was in Prague, okay. Yeah. And um, I went to the pub for an afternoon just with a, with a notebook and a pen and uh, telling my girlfriend I was going to work. You know, and, and I sat down and had, you know, five or six beers and then started thinking deeply about, about, about where to go next with this. But I was thinking, OK, I really want to like I'm obsessed with Latin American history and culture and, and I really want to write books set there. And I have loads of ideas and periods of history I want to cover. And I'm like, but readers aren't interested in it. So that's a tricky problem to solve. So I, was, I remember thinking, like, how do I bring my readers to South America? Like, how do I do it? How will I do it? And I was thinking for hours and I was like, well, I could have a character who goes there. It was such an obvious solution, but it, it took me six beers to figure this out. I could have a character who starts off somewhere in a more commercial setting, like, like Dublin, um, which is a bit more marketable to Americans. It's Indiana Jones. Yeah. Starts off Yeah, and in you get college. the whole fish out of water thing as well, you yeah. know? So um, your protagonist doesn't know all the local history and culture, so you can you not skip a bit of the research, but you don't have to feed all that to the reader in, in various artful ways, because this guy doesn't know anything when he arrives, so that makes your job a bit easier. But also, yeah, you're, you're physically bringing readers there. So the first book, and um, starts off in Dublin, and, and gradually he's gonna he's gonna end up uh, somewhere down there, and okay. and, that, and so just physically bring them there, and we'll yeah. see we'll see how it goes. I've only I've only um, I've only released the first, and that's 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 going pretty well. Actually, I I uh, I had um, like okay, so when you look get, getting back into the self publishing weeds for a second, like also bots, I'm, I'm obsessed with also bots at the moment, right? I think they're central to the entire Amazon recommendation engine. Um, and I, in ways that we only partly understand, um, like I think when you when you have an email spike, whatever books are in your also bots, like that will decide who's who, like which kind of readers are going to get targeted with the Amazon emails. And if you have the wrong also bots in your book, when you have a sales spike, those guys are going to get hit with, with the with the with the emails from Amazon. I'll give you right. an example, right? When I launched my second book, Mercenary. So, so, so what you're saying is that Amazon going to send emails to the wrong people? Yeah. So like you. when I launched my second historical novel, my platform among my audience was bigger among writers than it was among historical fiction readers. So I thought, well, I'll launch it maybe. I, I'll try a 99 cent launch. I've never done that. And I'll let my writer audience know about it. And maybe they'll like to try it. And then, of course, I got a good few sales from people who wanted to either check out the book or support me or whatever. And I, I had a pretty good launch like for... For my, my historical fiction books, I think I sold like, I don't know, four or five hundred that week, um, which was a good launch for me. And um, all my also bots were like marketing books and writer how to's. So then, like, so the launch went great for the four or five days I was doing the push. And then it just dead fish yeah. bounced. And I couldn't get, I, I, I sold a handful of books for like the next six months. No matter what I did, like, I'd throw some marketing at it, I'd sell a few books, and I would die again. And it was until I cleaned out those also bots. I think I eventually had to do a book bug free run or something to get right. historical books attached to it. So the, yeah, so the way around that is to make sure that the people who are interested in your genre are the ones buying your books, particularly in those early launch right. phases. Right. So uh, I, I always think of it like a newborn baby with a soft head that you have to protect. There, your your also bots are critical in those first couple of weeks. Um, so if you are a writer who writes in two different genres where there's no crossover, like let's say like me, nonfiction and historical fiction, when I launch my next historical novel. I won't tell my writer audience about it for a couple of weeks. I will wait, I'll tell my, I'm building separate lists now for historical fiction, and I'll, I will wait until organic also bots have attached itself, historical novels, and then, I can, then I'm safe to say, say it on my self-publishing blog, oh hey, if you want to check it out, I launched this book a couple of weeks ago. Because then it's safe, it's got, it's got the historical novel also bots already attached to it. Um, so yeah, like this, 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 these are some of the things you need to consider. Yeah. Like, you know, I've learned that the hard way. Yeah. You know, and, and, and like beginners might be thinking about like, like, how am I going to figure all this out when I launch? You don't have to. It's okay to make a few mistakes. Like I've made a ton of mistakes on the way here, um, but I'm still able to sell a few books and build an audience. So yeah. like, don't be afraid of, 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 of screwing up. You know, I've, I've done a lot of it. Tell people where they can find you. All right. Um, DavidGochran.com is, is my website. Uh, I'm rebuilding it at the moment, but there's going to be all, lots of cool stuff for writers there. In maybe two or three weeks, I'll, I'll launch the new site. Um, 
But from there, you can click through to my blog and you, you can see all the articles on marketing and self-publishing. You can see links to my books if you want to check them out. Um, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, probably too much time. Uh, you can check me out there as well, and Facebook as well, of course. Okay, and obviously these links will be in our show notes at selfpublishingformula.com. You should spell Gokhran, by the way. Oh yeah, G-A-U-G-H-R-A-N. It rhymes with Schwarzenegger. It's easy to, <laughs> easy to pronounce. And you look a bit like Arnold Schwarzenegger as well. I do, yeah, yeah especially with my shirt off. Yeah, well, I do try to but, get you uh, But Arnold Schwarzenegger now, not when he was young yes. and buff. Yeah. 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 So yeah, time can be so cruel. You look better than that. David, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much. And I want to say thank you on behalf of uh, us who are starting out in the self-publishing world for being one of the guys who we follow and read. And uh, you're very generous with that, as Mark is, and that makes a huge difference to us. Thank you very much. Yeah, there you go. As you say, Mark, um, somebody batting for us. And it's, I was going to say, it's easy to be conservative with a small c, and not put noses out of joint. That's how most of us are, right? Because that's where we think it's gonna be, you know, it's always a risk, it's gonna be harmful to your careers. And you you need the bombastic types, you need the people who get the, the bit between their teeth and take no prisoners. And um, David's not reckless like that. I think he's a complete, scrupulously fair actually, but when the time comes, he fights the corner. Yeah, he does. Uh, it's not in my nature to make a fuss about things. I suppose in some ways you could say that's selfish of me, um, but that's uh, just not, not kind of character that I am but um yeah David is is different and he is he is prepared to put his head above the parapet in ways that others aren't and that is it is important um and he's done he does good work and you know his blog is one of the the first I'd recommend to authors just starting out because um you know you can learn a lot of stuff you can learn what to do and, and equally important you can learn what you shouldn't do so he, he won't be afraid to call out um the predatory companies that circle authors and as we've mentioned before offer them uh, to publishing packages for stupid amounts of money when they could do everything themselves and he won't be afraid to call out um, marketers who are um, employing offering slightly dubious tactics to take advantage of um, authors and their understandable wish to see their career get a kickstart he, he'll call everybody out and it's um yeah it's an important role um, and he's done it for a long time and, and you know long long may he continue doing it yeah, and uh, we should say, I don't know if we said it in the interview or not, that Dave Gochran, David Gochran, uh, Gochran is spelt G-A-U-G-H-R-A-N. Obviously, you could tell he was Irish from uh, from the interview. Um, so if you want to Google him, Google his books, Let's Get Digital and Let's Get Visible are his two ones. And his new book, which he's announced recently, and I think he talked about it in the interview, is going to be published shortly. So um, one to definitely watch. I have to say... Um, We've been to Nink a couple of times. Well, no, we're have. definitely going to go. I've been twice. You've been <laughs> only once, once have you? Yeah. Well, I've been twice, and we're going to go this year, uh, as in 2018, next year. Um, and th the last time, it was the most... It was a fantastically dynamic group of people there. It was stimulating. Every conversation I had, I found motivational, got stuff out of it. So it's not just, obviously, I get a privileged position to sit down and really tap the mind of someone like David and Johnny and Sean, uh, etc. But in the evening over beers, you're talking, you're really getting down in the weeds, as uh, as they say in Kirby Enthusiasm, down in the weeds where the, the business gets done and try to understand where the trends are, what's happening, where the frustrations are, what's likely to happen in the future. And... Um, I know this, you know, it's expensive traveling to conferences, uh, but there's nothing quite like being in that atmosphere and soaking up uh, opinions from these very bright individuals. Yeah, and I'll be there next year. So, um, yeah, it's a good conference. It's one of my favorites. It's, um, it's a really nice part of the world as well. So a lovely uh, part of Florida to, to go down to. I'm, I'm yeah. traveling a lot next year. I've been in America at least three times, maybe four times. But they, I mean, Thriller Fest, RWA, Nink, I mean, all of these are opportunities. And the Smarter Artist Summit um, that Johnny and Dave and uh, cool. Sean run in February, uh, these are all opportunities. I saw, I saw the video they've got from last year's Smarter Artist Summit. And that, again, Dave Gotcom was there, etc. You could see a lot of familiar faces in the room. But there you've got a quite close environment to soak up what's going on. I think it's worth it. Perhaps choose one of those every year and just put some money aside to, to visit. So if it's going to be Nink, you'll see us. And it's going to be a slightly different Nink. I have had an email from Julie Ortolan, which I've not spoken to you about yet, um, about how Nink's going to operate this year. But uh, all I would say, because I don't want to jump the gun on their announcements, is it's definitely worth being a member of Nink if that's something you're, uh, you're thinking about doing. Good. That's it. The last one of 2017. The last double-digit podcast from SPF. Um, 
We've rejected your idea of doing number 100 naked. Oh. Uh, it's Kitty. I haven't interviewed Kitty Bacholtz yet. Normally the interviews are in the bag at this stage. Um, but uh, I'm going to have to find some way of celebrating it. Should we get a little party popper each? Yeah, we could do that. I think the budget might stretch to a, sing- yeah, just one. a single one. Yeah. No backups. It's got to go because sometimes they're duds and they don't fire. That just, we'll just have to live with that if that's the yeah. case. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a risk we'll have to take. Indeed. Okay. Thank you so much indeed for uh, persevering with us through our first full year. So we started in 2016. So this is, is that right? We started in 2016. Mm-hmm. 99 divided by 52. Yeah, it must be, must it? 52 yes, in a year. That's right. so, yeah. Yes. Um, so our first full year, it's been absolutely delight. This is, for me, this is the beating heart of SPF, this podcast. is what keeps us going week to week. It's the community um, and it's the bit that, that makes it most satisfying for us I think and uh, so and that wouldn't be the case without people listening so thank you so much indeed have a lovely happy new year and we will speak to you in 2018 bye bye you've been listening to the self-publishing formula podcast visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information show notes and links on today's topics You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.